Well, I asked you guys to submit your questions for the weekly Q&A, and you most certainly did respond. Got a lot of questions. I'm not going to be able to answer all of them, but try to get to as many of them as I can. Partially want to say that that means that we're going to split this up into two videos. Monday, I'm uploading this video. Part two is on Tuesday, so if you asked a question that didn't get answered on Monday's video, today's video, then it might get answered on the Tuesday video. And the other part is, I saw some of you starting to get a little more creative in your questions. I appreciate that. Nothing personal, but tend, we, we tend, after we do it for a while, tend to do the same thing over and over and over again. So I want to kind of mix it up, shake it up a little bit. Let's have some fun, damn it. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Reminder, if you want to participate, submit questions for future Q&As, follow me on Twitter, and you should smash that subscribe button as well. All right, Fear Size Leslie. Ooh, it's a lady. Hello, Leslie. Let's go ahead and kick it off with her question. Who do you think will be in a would win in an elimination style promo battle between the following? Hollywood Rock, 1997 Bret Hart, Samoa Joe, and the Tribal Chief. Great question. Uh, let's split them up into twos. So you got Hollywood Rock versus Bret Hart, 1997 version, and then Samoa Joe and the Tribal Chief in the other bracket. On the on the Samoan side, it's going to be the Tribal Chief. It's not just the volume and number of quantity of words that you spit out, which Samoa Joe could be very good at. It's the power and stink with which you provide those words. And there, the Tribal Chief dominates him, so he advances because he's a Tribal Chief. Hollywood Rock versus 1997 Bret Hart. I don't know that Hollywood Rock was the best version of Rock on the mic. But he was damn good. But so was 1997 Bret Hart. Like he was whining and bitching about everything. Like it was perfect. It was Bret Hart. But I still got to go with The Rock. Even if it was Hollywood Rock. And no disrespect to the Tribal Chief, but Hollywood Rock is still The Rock. And The Rock is still the greatest talker in wrestling history. So you got to go with him. Dalek of Chaos asks, If John Cena turned heel in the past, which option would have been better? Cena betraying WWE and willingly joining the Nexus, him embracing the hate to defeat The Rock at WrestleMania 28, or Cena joining the Authority and becoming the Authority's champion. None of those. Should have happened at Money in the Bank 2011. If you were going to do anything at that time, it would have kind of fed into the embracing the hate and going and facing Rock at 28, where you would still lose, by the way. Um, but I would have had him turn there. Like Vince and Larry and I just want to make sure that Cena doesn't lose the belt, that CM Punk doesn't win the title and then leave the company with it. So Cena does whatever it takes. Cena does what you would expect a corporate guy to do. My God, that would have made 2011 a whole hell of a lot more interesting. You could have won with the Nexus thing. Like you could have set it up at SummerSlam 2010 and went that direction too. And that would have been fascinating as well, but... No, nah, I, I think that Summer of Punk would have went to an entirely different level if you had Cena turn heel. Sinner51190, could you elaborate on the comments made recently by Mick Foley regarding the problems he believed WWE has? I personally share his opinion in that it's no longer a place for wrestlers to go to reach their full potential. They only push the breakfast club and that's it. And then he James lists out people such as uh, Charlotte Flair's the breakfast club. Let's be clear. Any labels of Breakfast Club membership come through me, not you. This is clearly established. Number two, personally, I don't see what was so earth shattering about what Mick Foley said. It's not like he's never criticized the WWE or things that they've done in the past. He's known to be an honest guy to a fault. It wasn't anything different. It wasn't anything new. And even if you say, well, because it comes from him, it means something, you know, maybe to a degree, but that's kind of platform propping too. Like the, the substance of what people say and the credibility of it shouldn't automatically be linked to how large their platform is. And it's not like he's the only person that has worked for the company in the past that has said this stuff. So I feel like it was more just a overreaction of a validation of confirmation bias of things that people were already saying as much as anything else. American Alicard. What's the most overrated, worst wrestling finisher today? Holy shit. (laughs) 
most of the ones in AEW because they got to hit it several fucking times in order for it to actually finish the match. A V trigger, Meltzer driver, whatever the fuck. Some really bad ones. Yeah. Worst wrestling finisher. Could have said Bray Wyatt and uh, Mandible Claw, but you know, I don't know. MC17 Clark. Why does Vince McMahon solely get the rap for being an evil promoter when all the old territory promoters like Vern Gagne, Ole Anderson, Bill Watts, Jim Crockett, Eddie Graham, Jim Barnett, etc. were just as bad, if not worse? Because most of those guys you named are dead or so old and so far removed from having any real power or decision-making abilities in professional wrestling. Because Vince McMahon is the biggest game in town. Because Vince McMahon put a lot of them out of business. That's why. He's not the only evil promoter, and I don't know that a lot of people give him that label of being an evil promoter alone. He's just the most prominent one. He's the most public one. He's the most known one, and he's earned that label as a result. Volfan0531, do you think it would be smart for WWE to use NIL to sign more collegiate wrestlers like they are for Gable Steveson? Yeah, use whatever advantages or opportunities you can to go after the types of talent that you've had that you've succeeded with in the past. You may potentially want to do that with athletes in football as well. Like It doesn't just have to be wrestling. So why not? Use whatever you can to your advantage. Rich Ladder 32 I'm not sure. It looks like you have written this question in New Japan, sir. I can't read it. It says three-way match between somebody, somebody, and somebody. I will assume this was you kind of lashing out and wanting to troll just a little bit um, because you were trying to be slick and it's, it's not going to work. So, um, and that's my guess, but... If I remember how to convert New Japan, what I think the real question you were trying to ask me is, is why are you so right about wrestling so often and how important is it for voices like yours to continue to be heard and have a platform? Well, that is an excellent question, Rich Latta. I'm glad you asked that. Um, I'm certainly not right on everything. Nobody is. I'm certainly less biased than a lot of the notable notable like YouTubers and the wrestling podcasters and especially the wrestling media. Um, so many of them can't help but give reach arounds and ball gag on Tony Khan or Vince or whoever. Like it still exists for both companies, believe it or not. Um, yeah, we need somebody like me. You might not always like me, you might always want me around, but you do need me because I provide some balance to the force. I help to keep things from going too far over to one side or the other. Help to bring some levity. Help to bring some um, sensibility, some logic to it. And just represent a slightly different perspective. So, it's okay that I'm still your internet hero, Rich. That's perfectly fine. And I appreciate your question. But that's the last time you try to go with the New Japan route and... Try to ask me some ridiculous ass question that you think I can't translate. I translated it. And there you go. Just Alex Central. Deluxe man. Holy shit. Thoughts on Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn potentially jumping to AEW when their contracts expire? Uh, I could see it happen with happening with both of them. And, you know, usually I guess they're always a package deal where one goes, the other goes. It's just... Kevin Owens, I could see becoming Kevin Steen again and him making a lot of sense for AEW. I think Sami Zayn in his current construction actually makes more sense in WWE because they force him to be different. They force him to be a different type of wrestler. Is he going to go back to being fucking El Generico? We don't need to see that shit anymore. That's stupid. So I could see it happening with both. I could see Owens having a place, although he's kind of on that Moxley spectrum. I think Sami Zayn admittedly would kind of get lost in the shuffle. I don't think it would go so well for him. Mojo underscore Jojo 1104. Who's been pulled out of more pages in WWE history? Chris Benoit or Brad Maddox? Well, we know whose pullout game is better. Beef mode. Brad Maddox. Holy shit. Obviously, it's Chris Benoit. But Brad Maddox's pullout game's got to be on point. <laughs> Ask Paige. Demarcus Flowers. You think you would get along with Seth Rollins seeing how you're both Midwest guys and you're both Bears fans. Oh, that is absolutely no proclivity to, 
you know, or no increase of likelihood to get along with somebody. Absolutely not. Because a lot of Bears fans are fucking morons. You got plenty of them that think Ryan Pace is a really good general manager. You got a number of them that still try to defend Matt Nagy. You have a number of them that think it was wise to start Andy Dalton in week one because they're a bunch of dumb dicks. This is the same fan base that for four years tried to justify, excuse, and defend Mitchell Trubisky at every length after spending eight years of the Jay Cutler experience largely doing the same damn thing and to worse levels than with Trubisky. So no, if anything, it makes me less likely to get along with them if they're a Bears fan because a lot of Bears fans are numbskull morons. And just because he's from the Midwest, I don't live in the Midwest anymore. Might be my roots and where I'm from, but I hate, I hate that part of the world. <laughs> Greg Bearhawk, 54. Does CM Punk and Brian Danielson's jump to AEW remind you more of Hall and Nash jumping to WCW or Hogan and Savage's jump to WCW? Uh, neither. It's just its own thing. If anything, it might remind me of the Radicals a little bit, but no. I, it's its own unique thing, so it doesn't remind me of either one of them. It doesn't. History Guy 007. The Young Bucks versus Lucha Brothers was, at All Out, was my first Bucks match. Oh, bless your heart. I did not like their style of no selling. What's the appeal? Honestly, History Guy 007, I don't know what the appeal is. Too many people have spent too many years reading and listening to and being influenced by magoos like Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez and, and the like. We got away from wrestling being about the characters, the storytelling, the theater, the pomp, the circumstance, to where you drove away so many millions of casual viewers that all that was left was the hardest of hardcore fans, and they said, we're going to be a gatekeeper, and we don't want these other people in, and we just want this to be about the moves and the matches because we value the shit that doesn't draw money because that's what selfishly appeals to us. Um, yeah, I, I think their, their style of a lot of their matches, not all of them, but a lot of their matches is fucking stupid. There's no storytelling. There's no selling. There's no anything. It's just crash test tummy bullshit and doing spot after spot after spot, and that's not talent. I look at some of the things that physically that the Bucks of Suck can do, and I say, man, imagine if they worked in there a little bit of character development into their matches. Imagine if they worked in storytelling. Imagine if they learned how to effectively navigate a match and map out a lay out a match from beginning to end, and then incorporated some of that shit. It would mean so much more. I don't get it either. I've never fucking gotten it. I think it's stupid, in my opinion. Victor Tran, 562. Is it really a good thing for AEW to just sign all of the mid to big names that WWE releases? Um, you know, on the sense of acquire talent and then maybe figure out what you're going to do with them, I don't think it's necessarily terrible as long as they can afford to do it and as long as it doesn't impact them too much financially. doesn't necessarily hurt. There does come a point in time, though, of... You start signing so many people that you try to justify your expense by therefore utilizing all of them and then it hurts everybody and nobody gets over in the way that they should, that that's not a good thing. Luke, what move that used to be a devastating finisher has seen its legacy diminish the most from overuse and oversaturation, like the DDT or the Super Kick? Those are two fantastic examples. Choke Slam would be another one. Um, I'll tell you, the one that's most notable to me, though, is the fucking pile driver. The Canadian Destroyer. Like, those are the two that really stand out to me. Those used to be spectacular things that very few people did, or whoever did do it, it was the end of the match. In fact, you would build an entire program, an entire feud around the fact that this guy couldn't use the pile driver. But now they're just sections of a chain wrestling piece. It leads to near falls and false finishes and bullshit. Canadian Destroyer. Pile driver. Those would be the other two on my list. Palma underscore C24. What are your thoughts on Vice's series, Dark Side of the Ring? What are my thoughts on it? Um, they've had some really good episodes. You know, in many ways, it's just a deeper dive into stories that we already knew. Uh, the one thing I, I question sometimes, because it's always a challenge to do it, especially when you're trying to condense it into an hour's worth of TV time. So really, maybe 42 to 44 minutes of actual content. Like when you tried to do a cradle the grave story, 
That is a lot of shit to cram in in a very small period of time, which leads to time condensing, which leads to key elements and key pieces being left out, could sometimes lead to liberties with some of the facts. Like, yeah, that piece I don't know that I always like. You know, so it's got some good, it's got some bad, just like anything else. But generally, an interesting watch. If for no other reason, it's a reminder of just how dark the wrestling business has been over the generations and you know how bad it is on us sometimes, frankly, to support this fucking bastard and evil-ass business. Vinny E underscore 21, which was more impressive, Jericho beating The Rock and Austin in the same night or Daniel Bryan beating The Breakfast Club in the same night at WrestleMania 30? It's got to be Daniel Bryan because he became The Breakfast Club killer that night. It's one thing for Jericho to beat Rock and Austin, but you know, at that time, you know, they, those guys probably already knew what the deal was coming up with Hogan Hall and Nash coming, you know, bringing in NWO. You know, we're not going to drop the strap to Triple H at WrestleMania. We're not going to be in that spot. So Jericho is the perfect guy to do that. So I don't think that's as amazing or as spectacular as Daniel Bryan having to go through a Triple H and then a Randy Orton and Batista in the same night. And even when he's supposed to be selling an arm injury, as soon as it became time to engage into breakfast club killer mode, there was no selling, there was no arm injury. It was just fucking on and popping like Orville Redenbacher. So I think that's that's the one. JJE261, where does Brock Lesnar rank on the A-plus player, B-plus player, whatever scale for you? Probably A to A-. minus. Probably A to A-. minus. Because to me, A-plus should be the absolute creme de la creme, super duper uber megastars. The Hogan's, Austin's, Rock's, Andre's, maybe Savage. He goes into that second tier for me, talking about Lesnar, maybe to the third tier. He's on the lower end of the second tier, beginning of the third tier. Kyle Garner, 92. I uh, hope you're doing well and everything's going great. Thank you. It is just with school and everything else, a busy time. As someone who just missed out on watching wrestling during the Monday Night Wars, what was the best part of re watching wrestling during that era? Oh, my God. You're a young buck, huh? Sorry you missed it. Uh, the best thing about that era was that feeling of every Monday night. I'm going to focus more specifically on Raw. But even you could say Thursday night with SmackDown and Thunder. Every week, you couldn't wait to see what was going to happen next. Every week, you had things happen. Every week you had surprises, you had big moments, you had shocks, you had stupid, you had spectacular, you had all of that. You had companies where it truly felt like they were all in from one week to the next. We do not have that now. We haven't had that level of it since. I miss that feeling of Monday nights being destination programming, being destination must watch, can't, must watch, can't mix, miss shit. Wrestling was so good back then and so fun back then that even if you had streaming options like Netflix and so forth available where you could say, hey, it would be available in a few weeks and you could you know, binge watch like a month worth of it in a row. You didn't want to miss anything, so you're still going to watch it live. That's what was most awesome about it. And then KOG715 is going to close out this round of the Q&A. Reminder with the second installment of this week's to come on Tuesday. KOG715 asks, Thoughts on fans saying that we are entering, already entering into another boom period in wrestling thanks to AEW and the like. <sighs> no. Might feel like a boom period for those that love AEW. It might feel like a boom period for those that are very hardcore in their thought process and philosophy towards wrestling, but this is absolutely not another boom period. Wrestling is not everywhere in pop culture. Pop culture isn't ripping things off from wrestling because it's so damn cool. It is not that. You've had two eras in my lifetime where that really was a thing. The Hogan era, the global expansion era, and then the Attitude era, the Monday Night Wars era. Those were boom periods. This is not a boom period. When you're bragging about it, I mean, it's an okay number for what you're dealing with now, but when we're bragging about AEW's Dynamite show doing 1.3 million viewers, that is hardly a boom period of wrestling. So no, it's not a boom period, and anybody that thinks it is, is just crazy. <laughs>